Good morning. And today's Monday morning mind muddle. Come on, I had to at least give you some pepper riddle, right? So today, go ahead and answer to yourself in a leap year. How many days are 24 hours long? All right, the answer is on a leap year. There are 366 days, but only 364 are 24 hours long. Daylight savings time makes one of those days long, and the other day makes it short. All right, here we go. Let's move on. All right, so you've watched the other video over on Khan Academy. So you have a rough idea of what we're looking at here. It's the idea of creating current uh, by moving wires and magnetic fields together. So normally I'd move this stuff around here and we'd be up on the smart board. And this lesson I normally do with a lot of questions to the audience and have you guys answer stuff. Obviously, can't do that in this environment. So the idea here is we have a wire and we move it through a magnetic field. Now obviously if I move this wire left and right, nothing's going to happen. Uh, we're moving those charges in the wire parallel to the magnetic field and any charge moving parallel to the magnetic field, there's no force on it. But Suppose we took that wire and we yanked it out of the board or into the board. If we do that, now we've got those charges moving across the magnetic field lines. So right hand rule, fingers go to the right. Um, motion is the thumbs that would be pointing toward our own noses. So kind of hold your hand out there, fingers to the right, thumb out towards your nose, and you see that there's a upward force on those positive charges. Obviously, the positive charges don't move, it's negative charges going downward, but again, we're going with positive current ideas. So what that means is, if we move this wire through the magnetic field and do it in the proper direction, it'll get those charges to be forced along that wire. If we change the direction of the movement of the wire, we change the direction of the force on those charges. That's generally the idea on how we're creating a current. Now, if it's just a wire like this, we're not going to get a current. We don't have a loop. But it would force the charges to one end or the other, kind of polarizing the wire. If we polarize it, we do get a voltage difference, a voltage potential difference from one end to the other. Think, think like a capacitor. Charges at one end, charges at the other end, opposite charges, potential difference. Same idea. So moving a wire through a magnetic field gives us a delta V, a change in voltage. That change in voltage, if we hook it up to an actual circuit, we'll actually get our current from it. So here's one of those wonderful losses by not being in the classroom together. Uh, this would be a demo I'd pass around with some metal pieces like you see here on the screen and a couple of neodymium magnets. The idea is if you drag the metal between the neodymium magnets through the magnetic field, you feel kind of a drag, a resistance. Uh, what happens is those charged particles, they get pushed into a circle um, as you would have any charges in a magnetic field. Uh, but since they're in the metal, those circles basically create what we call an eddy current. Uh, just that looping current uh, in the metal itself. But that takes work, takes effort, which means that you have to apply a force to push uh, the metal through the magnetic field. You get this drag effect. And there's a lot of ways to represent that. Um, if you were to take a piece of aluminum, if you have an aluminum cookie sheet at home, uh, take a magnet, put the magnet on the aluminum cookie sheet, tilt it. It will slide down the cookie sheet, but slower than something that's not magnetic would. Remember, aluminum is not magnetic. So it's the magnetic field creating a current in the aluminum cookie sheet. You can definitely try this at home with a fridge magnet and an aluminum cookie sheet out of your kitchen. Um, if you hold on to the magnet and drag it across the aluminum, you'll feel that drag. It's almost like dragging the magnet through a layer of molasses on the cookie sheet. The solid metal spatula you see in the picture here would give you the strongest resistive force because it gets the most current. Um, the one to the far right, this one over here, because it has the bottom end closed like this, it also feels a bit of drag, not as much as the spatula here. This fork here, because it has no closure on the bottom, it doesn't get a complete current 
around the bottom here, so you only get those eddy currents, which are not as strong, don't take as much effort, and you feel much less drag. So there's a noticeable difference between them. You might be able to recreate this one at home, but you have to have the right uh, tools, and they can't be steel because the magnet would stick to them. So moving metal through a magnetic field creates these eddy currents, and that takes work, so therefore you get a drag on it. Check this out. So what this is an example of is as that magnet moves toward the copper, it's inducing a current in that copper. That current in the copper has its own magnetic field, and that magnetic field will resist the incoming magnet. It has to resist it. If it worked with it and drew it in, it would draw it in faster, which would give you more motion, would give you more current, and there's that, there's that free energy you can't have. So this idea here is something you may have seen if you've gone to Great America and you've done the giant drop. Uh, there's the big ride where you sit in the chair, they pull you all the way up, they drop you. And when you get about halfway down, your acceleration downward decreases. You reach the bottom, and you actually actually get an upward acceleration as you slow down and stop. There are magnets in the seats and large copper strips on the column of the vertical drop. Let me see if I can find a video clip and add that here. Okay, so as previously stated, if we move the wire through the magnetic field, it will create an electric potential difference, a voltage from one end to the other. So here we've added a wire, and put the wire outside the field, because we drag the wire through the field, that's just going to cause another issue, we'll talk about that later. So just the rods going through. So we've got the magnetic field is for Tesla. The velocity of the wire is 2 meters per second. This is jumping back to what I talked about in an earlier uh, video about know what your variables stand for. Here we've got V for velocity, but eventually we're going to get V for voltage as well. So really, really make sure you are clear on what variable is what in a formula. Uh, that is L equals 0.5 meters. It's a scripty L. Uh, sorry, the font I used, that is kind of a weird little thing. Um, later in the formula, it might look like a divide sign. It's not a divide sign, it's an L for length. Um, we don't use capital L for a real major reason. You'll see that soon. And I is the current. So we don't know how much current's being induced in that wire. Of course, that's going to be our goal, finding the current in the wire. So um, we're going to come up with how we can come up with that current. So we're going back to our work calculation. We know work is force times distance. And we're pushing the charges through that length of wire L. So our distance is that L. The force on those charges is going to be equal to QVB, where V is how fast we're moving those charges through the wire. Q, of course, is the charge of the charge. Uh, and B is that magnetic field strength. Well, so that makes uh, work equal to QVBL. 
Um, we're going to use the EMF variable for a moment here. Remember that EMF is voltage. Eventually, it's going to be capital V. But just for the moment, since we're playing with a little V as well, I want to avoid some confusion. So we know work is charge times voltage. Rearrange it, and your voltage is the amount of work divided by the charge itself. So um, since work is QVBL, plug the QVBL into that equation. You're going to get the Q to cancel, and you get VBL. V is the velocity of the wire. The B is the magnetic field strength, and L is that length of the wire overlapping the magnetic field. Note in this case, the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. We're, push, we're pulling it straight through the field, crossing those field lines. If we pulled it at an angle, uh, of course, we'd have to decrease the EMF uh, because of that angle. And if the angle is zero, we're pulling the wire parallel to the magnetic field. No voltage, no EMF would be generated. Note, the sine theta is not on the formula sheet. At least it wasn't when I made this uh, particular slide. I don't know if they've changed it this year. Um, so the equation is your EMF, your voltage, is equal to VBL sine theta. You see why we use EMF instead of V? Otherwise, you'd have V equals VBL, which is weird. So that's the voltage generated. Now we want to get current. At this point, I'd ask you guys to tell me how you're going to get current. Lectures are a lot shorter when I don't take time to ask, ask questions, you guys. So we'd use Ohm's Law, V equals IR, and come up with a current that we have in that wire. All right, so here's a practice problem. Take a uh, wire, got a magnetic field. We're dropping the wire through it, which will generate an EMF. And at some instant in time, that velocity is 15 meters per second. Start out at zero, goes up to something higher, but at some brief moment, uh, it's 15 meters per second. We want to know what is that potential difference. I could set up a Socrative on this and have you go to Socrative and plug it in to make sure that you're actually doing this as, as an assignment. You know, this is a formula. It's a calculation. I'm sure you guys can all do it. I don't think I need to babysit you and make sure everyone plug this in their calculator and spit out a number. So I'm not going to make a Socrative out of it. I'm going to trust you guys want to know this material. So try it. Give it a shot. Some of you are already done with it. Pause it if you need another moment and then we'll continue on. Okay, so, <clears throat> calculate the EMF. Obviously, it's VBL sine theta. Sine theta is going to be sine of 90. It's going to be 1. And your speed times your magnetic field times your length of the wire. No big surprise is 90 volts. Everyone should have gotten that. Now, of course, if we just drop the rod through there, you're going to get that potential difference from one end to the other. If they are connected by a wire, and again, we're assuming this wire is not also moving, so it's just kind of stationary, um, then you're going to get a current uh, going through that wire. So go ahead and calculate how much current. Pause uh, to do that. And now assuming your pause is over, uh, of course we're going to use Ohm's law for that. V equals IR. And take your voltage divided by your resistance of 1.5 ohms, and you get whatever you get. Okay, again, I'm not hung up on the answer. I'm sure you guys can plug numbers into a calculator. But that's the idea. You just use Ohm's law at that point. Okay, let's make this a little trick here. I've got a plane, and this is a real-life situation here. You know, planes fly through the Earth's magnetic field. So as that plane flies through the magnetic field, you're actually going to induce a voltage potential difference from one end of the wing to the other. Now, you're not going to get a current because you don't have a complete loop. Um, yeah, you're going to get those eddy currents. We're not talking about those. We're talking about what potential difference you'd get from tip to tip. So here the wingspan is 15 meters. It's going 400 kilometers per hour. And the Earth's magnetic field is fairly weak. So pause this. Calculate this number. All right. Now, I said that it was going 60 degrees off the perpendicular, and technically that means the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field is 30 degrees. So there's a little, little trick in there. So remember, whenever you have a calculation that's got two vectors, in this case, you've got your velocity and your magnetic field. Uh, it's the angle between those two vectors that determines the angle that goes into the sine theta. Notice it's only 0.05 volts. Very, very small. Obviously, it's not a problem for the airplane. 
Uh, but it's one of those little oddities that actually does occur. All right, now what are we going to do with it? We haven't quite gotten to that section yet uh, that we saw in that earlier video. So here we've got the Faraday's induction law. You have to have that changing magnetic field. And that's what that early uh, video from Khan's Academy showed. The field has to be changing. If it's just stationary, nothing happened. So here we've got a loop, and this is a loop. Again, we're trying for a three-dimensional drawing here. So this is supposed to be a loop uh, that the plane of the loop is out of the board, and the magnetic field is going through the loop. That's the idea of the sketch. All right. So if we have a larger loop, we're going to get a bigger EMF. If we've got a faster change in magnetic field, again, bigger EMF, and, of course, the stronger the magnetic field we have. So those are the three things that affect it. So put those things together. And, by the way, if we lay the loop parallel to the magnetic field, no, ignore the beeps, by the way. Those are simply the physics teachers chatting with each other. And I, yeah, beep, beep, and I don't feel like uh, you know, restarting the recording just because there's some background beeps. So if it's uh, laid parallel like that, nothing goes through the loop, and it has to go through the loop for this to work. So it's proportional to the area of the circle. It's proportional to the magnetic field. The angle between the loop and the magnetic field. So this is usually done with a, a bit of a demo in the classroom, but picture a rod going through the center of the loop, piercing through the middle. That rod would be parallel to the magnetic field. That means the plane of the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is what we want. So we call that rod going through the loop, the loop's projection. So that's how they decided to work with the what direction is the loop. It's based on the vector that's normal to the plane of the loop. That's the loop's projection. So that has to be parallel to the magnetic field. Parallel, of course, means we're going to get the greatest value when the angle is zero, so cosine of theta for this one. And also notice we don't actually use... Uh, actually, we do the theta, that's fine. Um, so it's all proportional to all of those. We multiply, multiply all together. And we get the magnetic field times the area times the cosine of that theta, where, again, theta is going to be uh, zero at this point. And we call that the magnetic flux. Remember before we had the uh, electric flux, where we had the electric field penetrating the Gaussian surface. Well, this is going to be the magnetic field penetrating that actual loop right there. And this is one of those demos I had in the classroom. You may, you may have seen it. It was 3D printed. It was the red spikes with that black square. And the idea is showing that the more magnetic field you have going through the loop, the more flux you have. Now, in the case of electric flux, we didn't do much with it. And we used the electric flux concept to come up with Gauss's law, and we used Gauss's law, never talked about flux after. The magnetic induction is going to use the flux concept. So we're not going to toss it aside like we did with the electric flux. So recognize this. This magnetic flux is equal to how much magnetic field you have, the area that it's going through, and that angle between them. Note that there's nothing here about the number of loops. Uh, this is only about how much flux we have going through a loop. We will add a number of loops, but that'll be later in another calculation. So there's your concept. Flux is simply that product of magnetic field and size of the loop. That's not unlike the Gauss's law, the electric flux, that was the product of electric field and the surface area of our Gaussian bubble. So, same idea, but it's a loop instead of a uh, closed surface. Okay, so we got our flux. So now, uh, we're going to use that flux later to calculate our EMF. How are we going to get to it? So, we have our actual flux is that calculation. We have a general calculation, which is the integral of BDA. Notice that's a dot product. It is very specifically a dot product. Remember, dot product gives you cosine, cross product gives you sine. If we do the integral of BDA, that integral of DA is really just going to give us the area of a loop. So whether it's a circular loop or a rectangular loop, triangular loop, just doesn't matter. Calculate the loop as you would any other geographic or geometric shape. Um, and in this case, since it's a circle, or we're assuming this one's a circle, um, then that's going to be your pi r squared. The unit for flux is a Weber. It's a Tesla meter squared. Not Tesla per meter. It's a Tesla times meter squared. 
silly unit to try and keep track of, so of course we just call it a Weber. And for our first example, said first example, there we go. Alright, so we have a coil of wire with 100 turns, but again, number of turns doesn't matter yet. Perfect. Um, we've got a radius of the loop. It is It lies perp perpendicular to the magnetic field, which means that the projection is parallel to the magnetic field. Again, that's why we use projections, because it's an easier way to discuss it. It gives us a definite direction. Um, so here we've got the magnetic field turned on. And you don't need a changing magnetic field to have flux. You just need that changing magnetic field to get current and EMF, your voltage, all that kind of stuff. But the definition of flux isn't about the movement or the changing of it. The definition of flux is simply how much magnetic field, how much area. So it's a little more straightforward. Pause, go into your calculation. And here's your setup. So we've got our BA cosine theta. Plug in the magnetic field of 0.5 Tesla. The area is the pi r squared. Here, 0.06 to 8 Weber. Okay, that's the flux. Now that's assuming our magnetic field is complete. It's full, it's strong, it's powerful, maximum value. That's flux. When we talk about changing flux, that's when we'll get to our current and our EMF.